Okay, so welcome back for the final part of the conference. So I just have a couple of um, sort of housekeeping reminders. So during your break, miraculously, some feedback forms have arrived on your tables. So right in the middle of your table, there should be some feedback forms. Please do fill them in. It helps us to um, evaluate the day. Um, if you want to give any feedback on, on what you'd like to see or anything that you think needs to be changed for next year, then this is your opportunity to let us know. Um, for those that are online, you will have a link shared in the chat. Um, and that will also be sent at the end of the webinar as well. So just um, if you can just take a few moments to complete that before you log off, that would be fantastic. And just a reminder that if you have parked in St. John's car park um, associated with the hotel, just remember to log in your car registration so that you get um, a reduced parking cost. Um, so that's the little reminders. Um, so we're going to move on to the um, the final part of the afternoon. I'll hand back over to Professor Rob Moots um, to do that for us. Thanks, Roger. You're struggling to fill in the feedback form and you're not sure how to spell rubbish. Just put excellent down instead. It's easy to spell. Uh, okay, final session. It's gone by very quickly today. We've got two speakers and the first is going to be uh, uh, Emma. Uh, Emma Morgan is an academic clinical fellow in paediatric dentistry and it's going to be good to hear from Emma about important aspects of mouth care and oral medicine uh, and dentistry in Betchett's. Over to you. Hi everybody, uh, my name's Emma uh, and I'm an academic clinical fellow in children's dentistry based in Alderhey and the University of Liverpool. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief overview about the impact of oral health problems and sort of the evidence that we know, um, an overview of the sort of oral conditions that we come across, what different managements there are, and also the main thing is how can we prevent any further oral health problems. Um, so. Obviously, you all know better than I do how oral health problems can impact um, children and adults with Bouchette's disease. Obviously, most commonly pain, um, difficulty eating and speaking, secondary to mouth ulcers, difficulty concentrating, stress from that. But more recently, we've done um, a study where we've done some interviews with children with long-term health conditions, age between 8 and 16, to find out a little bit more about oral health problems and the impact on their quality of life. And they sort of gave us an even wider overview of the impact. So things like difficulty toothbrushing, but even more so, say, your bedroom's upstairs and your bathroom's downstairs, having the actually, if you've got joint pain fatigue and how those wider impacts can actually affect uh, oral health. Social impacts, if you like singing or your job involves talking a lot, then it can have a significant social impact. Self-management, a lot of the management options are trial and error. Everybody's a little bit different and their response to that is very different. And also um, healthcare system issues. As we know, it's very, very difficult to find an NHS dentist at the moment and we're, we're not blind to that fact. Um, so talk about oral ulceration. So obviously um, it's very, very common in Bichette's disease and there's three types of oral ulcers that we see um, and they're generally associated with their size. So minor, major and herpetiform. So minor um, are the most common um, and they're sort of your more standard ulcer. They're relatively small in size. They last a couple of weeks and they're they generally don't scar the mouth. You've got major ones which are a lot larger. They last for a significant amount of time um, and they can sc cause scarring. So you often find where these heal up, it means that the tissues are a lot harder and firmer um, and they can occur in any area of the mouth and particularly we see them in the throat and the oropharynx as you can see in the picture. And the least common is herpetiform. So it's a lot of small mouth ulcers in one area um, and they last again a couple of weeks and they're very common, as you can see here, under the tongue or around the tongue areas. Um, and there's lots of different things that can cause um, oral ulceration. And it's important not to forget about that because I think, especially when children maybe are going through the early diagnosis, 
there's a lot of things that maybe people would go through in order to get to the final diagnosis of Bichette's or any other sort of condition. And also it may be that there's another underlying condition that's actually making your oral ulceration worse. So it's very, very common in people who have um, hematology conditions. So things like anemia, gastro conditions, Crohn's, colitis, um, stress is a big impact, any sort of trauma. So it, it's important to think about the other causes and how they may be influencing how often you do get oral ulcers. And also, particularly for adults, it's important to think about the concern and features. So we know that oral cancer is another thing that's particularly common and it can initially present as an oral ulcer. Um, and for somebody who's very used to having oral ulcers, it may mean that it's quite easy to miss something like this. Um, so you can see a picture here of a more significant squamous cell carcinoma. Um, but the sort of features are persistent non-healing ulcers. It's very firm. It might bleed new symptoms. And it's really important if you see anything like that, or even if you see an ulcer that you think is a little bit different and you're concerned about to attend your dentist or your GP about that. So what um, different management options do we have? So these are some things that um, you can try at home. So diet is avoiding acidic or spicy foods and cinnamon and benzoate. So there's lots of different things that they're in, but the most common things, chocolates, tomatoes, tea, trying to avoid things like that. And again, alcohol and smoking. In terms of pain relief, um, so you've got a Diflam mouthwash or a spray. People prefer either one, depending on where the mouth ulcer is. And you can get that either over the counter or have that as a prescription. Um, toothpaste, so there's something called sodium lauryl sulfate or SLS, and that's like a foaming agent in a toothpaste. Um, so it can, it sort of exacerbates ulcers and makes them a little bit more painful. So we often recommend looking for toothpaste that don't have that in. And they're more commonly these toothpaste, um, Oranus and, and Pronamel. And again, oral hygiene, different mouthwashes, salty mouthwashes, chlorhexine or hydrogen peroxide. So the chlorhexine is a corsetal mouthwash. I don't recommend using corsetal mouthwash consistently. It's more if you think you've got one that um, is a little bit more severe or might be infected. Because if you use the corsetal mouthwash over a long period of time, it can affect your taste and it can stain, give your teeth a bit of a brown staining to them. Um, and then again, if we think about some of the prescribed options, so you've got different steroid mouthwashes that can be tried antibiotic mouthwashes or um, a lidocaine numbing spray that can be prescribed. These are the more, um, I suppose, simple prescriptions that maybe your GP or your general den gen dentist will be more au fait with prescribing. And then we've got the more systemic management. This usually comes as a, a more wider systemic management of other symptoms, and that includes sort of immunosuppressive agents, steroids, anti-inflammatories. Um, and these are usually led by a specialist. So obviously, if with us in Liverpool, we have the Centre of Excellence, so we have a dental team as part of an overall joint clinic, so we can have input into that. But maybe if you don't have access to that, there's oral medicine specialties and other specialties that might be available in a district general hospital that would be able to facilitate some of these treatment options. Another um, thing to consider, which maybe isn't so considered so often, is joint pain. So the TMJ um, joint is your jaw joint, and if you think about joint pain, people often forget that the jaw is a joint and can have the same symptoms. It's a very, very complex joint, and it can be, it's sort of two sides. It's either issues associated with the joint itself or issues associated with the surrounding muscles. Um, and the main considerations between the two are thinking about the timing of the pain. So if people are clenching throughout the night and you wake up in the morning and your jaw's really, really stiff and painful, it's usually more of a muscle pain because your muscles are obviously working really, really hard throughout the night and you wake up and the muscles are exhausted or if you've got a more a clicking jaw joint or your jaw is really, really deviating when you open and close, then it might be more of an underlying joint problem. Um, and there's lots of different factors that can influence that. And you can see a little image here of the wider muscles associated with the jaw. So it's the main muscle runs along the side of your jaw, but you do have muscles that run up to the side of the head and more inside the mouth. So you can get a lot of referred pain around the head and neck region. 
Um, so management of jaw joint pain, again, diet, going for softer diets, avoiding things like chewing gum or something that's going to keep your muscles working all of the time. Um, Anti-inflammatory pain relief can sometimes be helpful. There's a lot of jaw exercises. So it's the same as if you had uh, a bad knee, you might have physio, you can have physio that would involve the TMJ joint and it's mainly trying to mobilize that joint. If you think the muscles are really, really stiff around there, it's a lot of encouraging side to side movement, up and down movement of the jaw joint to get those muscles loosened um, and try and sort of relieve some of those symptoms. And another option which you can have with a general dentist is a bite guard. So it's something that will cover the surfaces of the teeth. They're usually a soft rubber material and that can just alleviate some of the symptoms. And what it also does is if you know that you're grinding your teeth, it also protects the teeth at the same time. Um, but everybody finds that a little bit different. Sometimes people don't like having something extra in their mouth and it makes them grind their teeth more, but it's something worthwhile knowing about and having a discussion with. If it is something that is of great significance and those sort of earlier options haven't managed any of your symptoms, then it may be worthwhile having a referral to a specialist. So it may not be something that sits within a normal clinic, but we have a lot of um, sort of maxillofacial services that are around the country and they know quite a lot and manage quite a lot of um, jaw joint symptoms. So that can be a useful referral to consider. It might involve a, um, a further assessment if they're really concerned about the actual physical jaw joint itself. And sometimes we do MRI scans of those joints. Um, and the management is very, very varied depending on the cause. But some things that I've seen more commonly are um, steroid injections, very similar that you can have in other jaw joints. If it's um, very muscular in origin, then we can use Botox. A lot of people actually now choose these days to electively have Botox in their masseter muscles either side um, to relieve some of the jaw joint symptoms. But that is an offer that uh, something that we offer as a specialist service. And then again, does the management of the jaw joint pain need to be part of a wider uh, overall management? And then I'll talk a little bit about um, prevention sort of all the way through the years. It might be people who have young children here. Um, so think about how to prevent any sort of dental problems between the age of zero and three. So the first thing is we usually recommend that a child go to the dentist by the age of one as soon as they have their first teeth. Um, people don't really know that. Everybody gets a little bit confused about when should I actually first start going to the dentist. So it's very, very young um, and getting used to going to the dentist. And the main thing is, is trying to um, avoid feeding throughout the night so if it's mainly through a bottle so we usually discourage that from the age of one and starting a free flow cup from six months and again toothbrushing should start from as soon as the first tooth erupts twice daily with a fluoride toothpaste and using a smear of toothpaste as you can see on the image but as you can imagine it's it's not always as easy as me saying twice daily when you've got a little one at home um and then if we think about three to six years, so we usually say supporting toothbrushing um, until a child can tie their two lace, shoelaces by a parent or a carer. And again, it's twice daily toothbrushing. So the most important time to brush teeth is actually lasting at night. If you think that everything you eat throughout the day sits in the teeth on the, in the night, and it means it has a lot more time to attack the teeth. So we always say lasting at night and at any other time. Any other time doesn't have to be first thing in the morning because everybody's daytime routine is slightly different. That doesn't always fit in. So it can be any other time. Um, and for this, we recommend at least 1,000 parts per million fluoride. And that's often what's seen in a children's toothpaste packet. Um, and we recommend checkups for pretty much most children um, every six months to have fluoride applied to their teeth as a preventative. And then we go on to seven years, and this pretty much covers from seven years up until 101 plus. So it's pretty much everybody. So again, the main um, key messages are twice daily toothbrushing, lasting at night and another time. An adult toothpaste has 1,450 parts per million fluoride. And then you can find that if you go in the ingredients on the back of the toothpaste, um, you'll be able to see that. So actually you'd be surprised that a lot of children, maybe seven, eight, nine, still use in a child's toothpaste. So it's important to transition over to an adult one. Um, making sure not to rinse your mouth after brushing your teeth to keep the fluoride on the teeth. And also thinking whether you want to use any brushes to clean in between your t in the teeth. You can see little TP bottle brushes here or a little um, floss harp. So you can try lots of different things that are available in the supermarkets in the case of picking what, what works for you really. 
and just some other tips of where you ways you can adapt things so you can get handles that can go on toothbrushes if you struggle with the grip or you can use like um a play-doh mold almost a mold into your hand around a toothbrush um a dr barman's toothbrush you can get on amazon which is a three-headed toothbrush it's really really good for anybody who might have any additional needs it means that it's got three heads so rather than having to try and clean all of the surfaces you can actually get a more of the tooth in in one fell swoop um, electric toothbrushes, there's no evidence to suggest any difference between the two, but I'm a big fan of an electric toothbrush. Different toothpaste that we've already discussed, and the bottom ones, purple teeth, look a bit funny, but it's actually a plaque disclosing tablet. It's a little tablet that you chew on, and it shows um, where, to, where the plaque is so you can know where to brush the teeth. Um, and some extra prevention is there's lots of different things that... Um, can be prescribed by a general dentist that have fluoride in them, which can, is the best prevention. So you can see eight, 10 and 16 years plus those can be considered. And I'll go on to the, the final little bit, which is finding a dentist. So it's the most difficult thing. So the first thing is if you go on the NHS Find a Dentist website and push, put your postcode in, it will highlight practices that are taking on new patients. There are other services available. So a community dental service or a hospital dental service that are on a referral only basis, but there are different people who can prescribe provide those referrals. It might be if you're a child, a pediatrician, or um, within an adult service, anybody who's involved in your care can make a referral to those services. Um, so thanks, and take any questions later. So there will be a few questions for Gemma, the question and answer, she can't escape quite so easily. Uh, so our final speaker before the panel is, gonna, is uh, Dr. Nima Gadiri, consultant ophthalmologist. Nima is a medical ophthalmologist that specializes in things like inflammation and Betchett's, and he's the ophthalmologist at our Betchett's Centre. We almost didn't have him today because he's come across straight from uh, uh, a meeting in Poland, and when he was uh, getting on the plane at Poland, the driver took him to the wrong airport. But thankfully, he got the right airport, and here he is, Nima. Thank you, Rob. I was hoping to already get my excuses in for my talk, but uh, thank you very much indeed for that introduction. Great. So I'm a, as, uh, I'm a, as mentioned, I'm a medical ophthalmologist, so I deal with the eye in relation to the rest of the body. Quite a rare speciality. There's only um, 15 consultants in the whole United Kingdom, and we all know Bechet's disease can affect the eye uh, in many different ways. So I'll do a almost whistle-stop tour of Bechet's and the eye. Um, there's a lot of jar jargon in, in ophthalmology in general, in uveitis, lots of Latin, lots of Greek. Uh, some of it's still Greek to me. Hopefully uh, it won't be for all of you. Um, this is so. Throughout this talk, I've peppered it with um, uh, draw, drawings from a uh, Romanian artist, Adrian Sergei, who um, has Bechet's uveitis, and his art just um, is quite evocative. Just kind of um, portrays how it affects it, it's, him emotionally. So, as mentioned, I'm a medical ophthalmologist. This is a shoddy homunculus. The eye is related to the body in many different ways. Um, does anyone know who the chap on the left is here? one of my heroes, really sadly left his um, original career as a doctor to become a, a writer. So um, he's a medical ophthalmologist called uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle who went into writing that and he based his main character on his mentor on the right who is, who is Joseph Bell. Um, the eye just gives you a window into the body in lots of different ways. So you get to see blood vessels, the immune system, the metabolic system, and there's nothing quite like it. And we're in this era of oculomics, so predicting, diagnosing systemic diseases often years before they can be spotted. Things uh, using ocular biomarkers, things which are objective, measurable, and can evaluate the process of disease. And we're blessed in ophthalmology in that we've got lots of new technologies when it comes to imaging and diagnostics, and they're really combining with AI to make this a very fast-moving um, uh, field. So history, I wanted to go back to see when was the first mention of anything relating to Bechet's and the eye. And it's one of the three fathers of Western medicine, Hippocrates, on the right next to Galen and Avicenna. And in his third book of endemic diseases, he describes what was effectively um, seems like uveitis in the eye, although albeit lacking the anatomical precision to differentiate uveitis from other causes of redness or visual loss. But um, that's probably the first mention of uveitis. 
So I'll just really quickly go through uh, manifestations, diagnostics, challenges, and future directions. Um, starting with manifestations. And we know that within Bechet's disease, ocular manifestations can be the most serious implications and can affect roughly 70 to 75% of patients with Bechet's disease. Uh, up to one quarter of these suffer from severe vision loss. And it's the sudden and the recurrent nature of uveitis, but particularly the complications of uveitis, which cause this. Men um, get uveitis um, more frequently and more severely than women. Um, on the left, there's a survey of uveitis specialists showing what, the, what signs they consider most characteristic of the disease. Um, so anterior uveitis, that's the front of the eye, we'll go through that, and retinal vasculitis are the most common, and retinal infiltrates. Um, on the right is a survey of ophthalmologists in the United Kingdom, so any kind of ophthalmologist, even those in eye casualties, and uh, asking them what's the most common manifestations that we see in eye emergencies from Bechet's, and it's usually vitritis, so that's inflammation in the middle of the eye, and anterior uveitis. But what is uveitis? Uveitis, so uveitis literally, itis means inflammation, uvea means grape, and that comes from the old term of the eye as a kind of grape, a big globe on a stalk. And it's inflammation of this entire uveal tract, which is the image on the right. So the iris, the ciliary body, and the retina. And you can divide it by different anatomical locations. So anterior, the front of the eye, uh, it, where most of the inflammation um, uh, can be, is where we generally focus on, 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 on that anatomical distinction. So intermediate, the middle of the eye, and posterior, um, the back of the eye. Uveitis and Bechet's, um, mostly but not always of uh, sudden onset, so people can wake up with dramatic loss of vision. It, it can be of limited duration uh, usually, but it recurs. Uh, both eyes are usually affected, but it's normally one eye at a time. Uh, rarely just an anterior uveitis, often a pan uveitis, all the layers of the eye, and occlusive retinal vasculitis, which means inflammation of the blood vessels at the back of the eye. Um, and it's the blockages in that occlusive retinal vasculitis which is what causes damage to the retina and the optic nerve during the span of the disease, and that's what leads uh, uh, pa uh, visual disability in, in, in patients. But what, what I always say about all types of uveitis, and particularly Bechet's, is that every single pa patient's different. Every, everyone manifests uveitis in different ways. I have a uveitis cl clinic on Monday, and um, you know, some of the patients there can teach me about their condition as much as I can uh, ever speak to them about it. So it's it's a very um, it's a complex entity in terms of how it presents, and each patient's journey is different, really. So um, even in 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 um, Turkey, where there's a lot of um, Bechet's uveitis, they looked at photos. These are the uveitis specialists, and found that the incidence varied between 56 to 81 percent of uveitis specialists agreeing on whether this is Bechet's uveitis or not. But the main things they, they kind of con concurred on were hyperpian, uh, retinal infiltrate, and bleeds, retinal hemorrhages, and also branch retinal occlusion, occlusion, vein occlusion, so the blockage of the vein in, in the retina. So again, lots of jargon, but we'll just quickly skim through all of these. Um, anterior uveitis, so inflammation in the front of the eye, that's the kind of bread and butter of um, uveitis in general in, in, the, in the country and the world. Um, classic symptoms are red, light sensitive, headaches, and what I see in, in my um, clinic are cells in the anterior chamber. These are inflammation in the front of the eye. You also see fl a flare. So flare is a foggy appearance, and that's caused by the protein which is leaked from infl inflamed blood vessels in the eye. Pupils often irregular, and there's features uh, which, we, which we see, such as this um, ring ciliary flush. And in Bechet's uh, uveitis in particular, there's often, or there can be, this a hypopian, so that's pus. Pus in the anterior chamber, and it forms that little pool because of gravity, uh, and it can happen in one quarter of very severe cases of uveitis. It suggests we need prompt treatments, so steroids and immunosuppressive therapies to reduce inflammation and prevent visual loss. But it does improve very quickly when the uveitis is treated. So that's a good marker of improvement of very severe cases. And it's quite fragile anyway. You, you find that even if patients shake their heads, um, it can disperse and it becomes less noticeable. Um, another cause of painful red eyes, which I see quite often, although there's not much in the literature about just, just scleritis and episcleritis in Bechet's, but um, you, do, you do tend to see it in practice. 
this is again um, uh, a cause of red eye and it's uh, inflammation of various layers of the front parts of the eye, episcleral vessels and scleral vessels, which are deeper than that. The distinction can be quite difficult to, to make. Episcleritis and, uh, is, is a bit less painful than scleritis where the pain is severe and it's deep-seated. They can both um, improve with just local treatments such as steroid drops, but often you do need um, immunosuppression for the severe scleritis cases. And this is posterior uveitis, so this may be more dangerous and vision-threatening uh, because it actually causes, in many cases, fewer symptoms uh, compared to the anterior uveitis, which causes people to have red, light-sensitive eyes. Uh, so painless reduction in vision, but floaters can be a symptom that you can, you can get. And where the haze and vitritis can be severe, it can be quite difficult to, to see how severe, how, how to kind of discern how bad this might be. Um, these white spots over here, they're retinal infiltrates, so they represent active inflammation. Usually, they um, uh, disappear within days once treated with no scarring. This is retinal vasculitis, uh, two different um, uh, features of patients who have retinal vasculitis here. The one on the left is uh, retinal periphlebitis. This is just inflammatory cuffing of, the, of this blood vessel. This is actually a, a, a retinal vein occlusion and um, that can lead to fluid in the back of the eye, which is often treated by laser or injections in the eye, anti-VEGF injections. Again, symptoms that you might experience are decrease in vision, again, painless, sometimes floaters, sometimes bits of your visual field which are missing. And this is one of the uh, severe sight-threatening uh, manifestations. So this is occlusive uh, necrotizing retinal vasculitis. Um, and... Uh, this is a photo that we do an optos scan, so quite a nice wide scan of the back of the eye. This is a fluorescein angiogram, so dye is injected in the body, and we get photos, and we just notice the leaking pattern of vessels. So this is the same patient, uh, but different eyes, and the, the whole, there's, there's some inflammation there, and the whole bottom part has been obliterated. This is the other eye, and you can see there's loads of vessels elsewhere, but here there's almost nothing that represents um, that ischemia or damage to the blood vessels, um, and that's what causes the blackout there. So it's the complications of this which are which are the issue, which we'll go on to next uh, soon. Um, a quarter of uh, Bechet's patients with eye manifestations have an affected optic nerve. So this can be seen either as something called papillitis or um, progressive optic atrophy due to the vasculitis. That's damage to the optic nerve, which happens because of that inflammation in the, in the back of the eye, and specifically the arterioles which feed the optic nerve, the little blood vessels. <coughs> Again, classic symptom of painless loss of vision, but with optic neuropathy, when the nerve is affected, there's a reduction in color vision uh, and reduction in visual fields, which are very specific symptoms. Sometimes uh, pain uh, behind the eye as well, and pain on eye movement. But it's, this is not the only cause of these kind of swollen nerves. Sometimes even clots in the brain or in the sinuses can cause raised pressure in the brain and um, can also cause swollen optic nerves. That's an example of uh, the kind of patient I might share with our, our neurology colleagues. Um, so uh, you know, hence why we have uh, collaboration in, in our centers because these, when they present, can span two, three, four different specialities. And then um, with um, Bechet's uh, and many autoimmune diseases, we find dry eyes to be uh, very, very prevalent. So a lot of my patients who might not have infl inflammation still suffer from dry eye symptoms. Um, one thing which can drive, it, drive this is this entity on the left called blepharitis. Um, that is inflammation uh, of the oil glands in the eye eyelids sometimes associated with infection, particularly one organism called Staphylococcus. And anterior blepharitis is on the front of the eyelids, on the outer edge. Posterior blepharitis is on the inner edge. And um, that can drive dry eyes, which is on the right. That's, again, using that same fluorescein dye um, to look at the surface of the eye and just showing which bits are not being well lubricated. So when I see a, a very dry eye like we've got on the right, I would give a very um, intensive lubrication regime, a regime of drops to make sure... Um, uh, they're not experiencing um, all the symptoms you get with dry eyes, which, which can be sometimes paradoxical symptoms. So dry eyes cause you know, pain, light sensitivity, headaches, but they can also cause a paradoxical watering. So people think, oh, I've, 
how can I have dry eyes when my eyes are watering? And that's almost a feedback loop which leads to overstimulation of the tear producing glands, uh, which aren't quite doing the job and it just becomes more and more uh, severe. So moving on to diagnosis, again, the art from um, Adrian Sergier there. These are some of the tests that we do in our um, clinic. So tests which look specifically at the function of the optic nerves, such as color vision, such as visual fields. Top left is, a, is the test which my um, uh, technicians do the first, which is to check the visual acuity. And then on the bottom right is what I tend to do, which is use the slit lamp uh, machine to look at the back of the eye in detail from the front to the back in Bechet's including the, the retina and the optic nerve, and also to measure pressure. And as I mentioned right at the beginning, we use lots of different scans, and there's new scans um, coming out or being explored. So on the left, I've got Photos and Optos. Optos is a laser which creates a false color, uh, false image, um, but gives you a lot of uh, width. So you have, can look at the retina as a whole. In the middle, we've got that fluorescein angiogram, um, which um, in this case shows a retinal vasculitis. Uh, sometimes you get this kind of um, fern-like appearance to um, uh, indicate that there's leakage in the back of the eye because of vasculitis inflammation of the blood vessels. And on the right is this ubiquitous OCT um, uh, investigation that we do. So that's a cross-section scan that shows inflammation and the fluid in the back of the eye. Um, both of these patients have Bechet's uh, uveitis, and on the bottom right, there's a serous inflammatory retinal detachment, which usually improves with treatment. So now let's focus on the potential challenges. Uveitis, it sounds scary, but um, bond or uveitis is reversible. So it's up to ourselves as eye specialists, it's up to in the community, our optometrists and our colleagues to, to find, to spot uveitis early, to action the issues that we see early and prevent these complications from happening because it's these complications which lead to loss of vision. So this is one called synechii. This is um, synechii, basically adhesions, adhesions between different structures in the eye after inflammation, usually the adjacent parts of the eye, the eye being having so many different layers and being such a complex organ. Sometimes people don't really notice symptoms with this, but sometimes it can make vision quite blurry. Um, it's if they zip down the eye, if they really kind of um, uh, impact the natural drainage of uh, the fluid in the eye, like you've got on the image on the right, um, which becomes an issue because that leads to this, which is glaucoma. Glaucoma is damage to the optic nerve caused by high pressure in the eye. Uh, the uveitis in Bechet's itself doesn't cause um, raised pressure. Other uveitis, causes, uh, uveitis entities can increase the pressure in the eye, but Bechet's by itself doesn't necessarily do that. But steroid drops are one of the treatments we give for anterior uveitis can raise eye pressure. And if the inflammation does block the normal drainage mechanisms in the anterior chamber angle of the eye, so uh, where, where um, the, the, the fluid which is in the eye is, is kind of drained out, that can cause angle closure glaucoma. And that can be really painful, can cause loss of vision, nausea, and vomiting. And it's one of the things um, which can happen after uh, vasculitis as well. Um, so on the bottom left is iris neovascularization. Um, new vessels forming in the retina, of course, but also as in the iris. And the, it's the one in the iris and the adjacent structures which can lead to something called neovascular glaucoma, which needs urgent treatment. So getting pressures checked is very important. Um, for anyone with uveitis. Cataracts. We, we, everyone will get cataracts if we live until the age of 100. It's just um, uveitis and the treatments we give for uveitis bring it forward. So cataract is clouding of the lens of the eye and that causes blurring of vision, which is usually progressive, but you do get instances where the symptoms uh, become uh, obvious a bit unexpectedly. So sometimes people, their cataract just, just starts affecting the optic axis and then, and then they notice it. Um, and we, we, in our eye departments, we have uh, all, all our colleagues who are ophthalmologists, everyone apart from me basically, can deal with cataracts. But just cataracts in the context of inflammation, such, such as you get in Bechet's disease, needs to be more carefully uh, addressed and approached in terms of perioperative management, in terms of how you look at the immunosuppression. And, and sometimes, for example, I might just increase the steroids temporarily to cover um, a cataract operation. This is what we want to avoid. This is end stage disease. So at this stage, there won't be any more flares of uh, Bechet's. Here you've got, you can see the optic nerves, um, they're pale. 
then you, these vessels are coated in white. They've become what we call sclerotic. And uh, multiple episodes of retinal vasculitis and vascular occlusions have basically damaged the structures in the back of the eye. Um, so this is uh, end stage disease. At this stage, things, uh, there's, no, there's no further, unfortunately, there's no further treatment which can be done. And just in um, conjunction with um, uh, the earlier talk from uh, Suzanne Crozier and obviously the um, sketches that uh, uh, Mr. Sergio um, that I've put from, from his art on here, it's the emotional impact um, uh, with Beshet's uveitis, which, which we need to be aware of. And sometimes within medicine, we're, we're perhaps not so um, attuned to emotional and psychological effects. That's why there's been more recent studies looking at quality of life questionnaires, uh, evaluating the importance of um, vision-related quality of life, especially in people with Beshet's uveitis. And they found that it serves as a significant predictor of depression and anxiety. And there is a bit of a feedback loop here because we also know that flares of uveitis are also triggered by stress, by anxiety, by environmental um, changes. So, um, you know, that's why in our national centers we have uh, psychological and uh, social support uh, services and why it's so important for uh, for many of our patients. And I've noticed with a lot of our Beshet's uveitis patients in, in particular. So future directions, I just want to take stock on where we're at currently. So this is on the left, just a, a kind of classic ladder of treatment with inflammation in the eye going from uh, masterful inactivity, um, the philosophical term, to drops and uh, even non-steroidal drops. I put steroid drops there, steroid tablets, then the immunosuppressants, which we've had for decades, and the more recent targeted biological uh, therapies, which we've had since around the turn of the millennium. Uh, and on all levels of this ladder, there's scope to improve the treatment and side effect profile. And there's obviously always exploration of new potential treatments, which are more efficacious and which have less side effects. So that's something which happens throughout um, autoimmune medicine. Um, there's also improvement in surgical techniques. So on the right, the instance, which is still rare, but where there's just too much inflammation and debris in the eye, the only solution might be to um, take some of the jelly out of the eye, a vitrectomy, which reduces some of the vitreous humor in the eye. Um, these kinds of surgical techniques are also being honed as well. Um, thankfully, uh, not, not many people need that, but we have very highly skilled vitreoretinal surgeons who can do that. And we're in this era uh, of innovations and biomarker discovery. So uh, a better understanding of all the biomes of the body, including especially the microbiome, um, the gut microbiome and how that affects inflammation in, in the eye and inf inflammation in the rest of the body, uh, the genome, um, the proteome, so all, the, all these ohms, um, and understanding what leads to these persistent immune mechanisms and hopefully finding new biomarkers um, and being able to quantify um, Beshet's uveitis a bit better using, using our scans will be what we're looking forward to soon. Uh, we've got new therapeutic targets which are always being explored. So these are some of them on the bottom right, everything from uh, a particular gene to an immune disbalance to pathways and various chemical messengers, which we call cytokines. Um, I'm involved in some clinical trials for uveitis in general, which includes Beshet's uveitis for um, injections in the eye. So non, so injections in the eye which aren't steroids, so don't have the side effects of steroids. They're still injections in the eye, but um, hopefully won't have some of the complications. These are for obviously severe uh, uveitis cases. Um, so hopefully there'll be um, exciting things coming out from that as well. Um, and that's it really. I think, um, I suppose my key takeaways are relating to the importance of awareness and early diagnosis of ocular involvement and what we value so much in the NHS and within our three centers, which is that multidisciplinary approach to, uh, to management. Uh, thank you. Okay, so we've got a few questions online. Uh, I'm going to just work my way through some of them, but if you would like to ask a question, just attract Gemma's attention, and we'd like to cover your question as well. We want to try and make sure that everybody uh, gets...
a question. I wonder if, if Jackie and uh, Martin could just move across because they're just being dazzled by the by the thing. By the brilliance. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, there's one very pessimistic question which I'm not going to ask Nima, which is what's the worst case scenario for the eye? So Nima, forget that one because we're not going to consider anything like that. Um, I think, Gemma, we, there's a couple of questions that would be, uh, I think, fascinating for you. Number one, one of the uh, uh, people online have, have said that they, well, is there a difference between geographic tongue, whatever that might be, and her petiform ulcers? Because when she has a flare, her tongue looks like a map of Africa. <laughs> Are they two different things? So, Gemma, you tell us. Yes, yeah, so they are two different things. Um, Geographic tongue, it, it can happen in anybody and it's generally sort of a, a benign condition and it, what it is is you have little papilla that sit on your tongue, taste buds uh, and sensation and it's just the way that they form, it means that they just alter position and it means that some areas of the tongue become more sensitive to things like spicy foods and things like that compared to the others. Whereas if you think about an ulcer, an ulcer isn't the actual like breakdown of the surface of the mucosa of the tongue to expose the underlayers, whereas a geographic tongue doesn't do that. So they are different things, and we see geographic tongue quite a lot. Um, in terms of managing geographic tongue, it's very much sort of symptom management, so things like Diflam mouthwash, avoiding spicy foods, acidic foods, and, and things like that. Yeah, thank you, Gemma. And, that, and that's an important thing, because one of the things you might think, why do we keep asking for photographs? Of, of ulcers and things. It's because lots of lesions can occur when you're looking in the mouth, when looking for ulcers in other places in the skin. And sometimes you can't magic up an ulcer just to suit a doctor's appointment. So taking a photograph is really, really helpful to us. And sometimes we find people who worry they've got an ulcer. In fact, it's geographic tongue. And just by seeing that can immediately uh, dispel any concerns. Another quick question for you, Gemma. Oh, while, just before, I'm going to be uh, asking in a couple of minutes, each one of you, okay, no pressure, to name uh, what you feel would be um, a major development that's just about to occur or has occurred in Betchett's in your field. Okay, I'm going to be asking all of you, I'm going to be asking Graham for a scientific advance. So we'll just warm, it, warm up for a minute uh, asking other things, but I'm really keen that we, you can share with us what you think is either a major breakthrough or a breakthrough that should be happening but isn't happening. Um, but before you escape, Gemma, um, I also want to ask you about dry mouth because one of the patients... Uh, mentioned that she had a very has a very dry mouth is that something which is linked into Betchett's or is it something different and and how can that be helped um again dry mouth is is really really complex because it's 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 very subjective to every person so somebody might look like they've got a lot of saliva in their mouth, but personally they feel that their mouth is, is, is very, very dry. So it's very, very different between people. It is commonly associated with um, autoimmune conditions and the management is, it is quite difficult again because a lot of the things that are out, that are out there, sort of saliva replacements and things like that aren't, aren't the best things in the world. So maybe going back to your question of things that haven't happened is having a better, substitute for saliva to improve function but it is common more common in, in the adult population than children um and again it's working alongside our oral medicine colleagues who are really really uh, sort of experienced in that field to actually assess the amount of saliva that you have in your mouth is the only way that we can stimulate what you do have or do we then have to replace it with something else and another thing is it means that people often will eat quite a lot of sweets to try and stimulate their saliva like lemon drops sherbets and things like that which work really well but it has the other consequence of it means that you're very very likely to get dental decay and holes in your teeth um, and something that's very common with dry mouth so it's if you are thinking about something to stimulate the saliva going for something that ha is sugar free or has like a, a xylitol which is a sugar replacement instead to try and avoid going from one issue and moving it to the other thank you if you could hand the hand the microphone to your right to dr gadiri 
who thought he was going to get away with it. We have a we have a very specific question for Dr. Gadiri, who I would like to answer this in an accurate but diplomatic way. Um, so the question is: A doctor at the International Bechets Conference last month in uh, uh, in Morocco that some of us had the pleasure of attending said that if a patient has snowballs as part of their intermediate uveitis, they don't have Bechet's and need to look for another diagnosis. Well, this person who sent it in has Bechet's and has had snowballs, which must be a technical term for something in the eye. I'm sure it's not really snowballs in the eye. Um, they've had snowballs in their eye for years. C could you comment on that, Dr. Gadiri, please? Oh, yeah, just um, to go back to my talk, um, the disparity in uh, views even amongst uveitis specialists in populations which see a lot of Bechet's uveitis uh, is still huge. I would I would disagree with that. I think uh, it's a, a, a controversial statement to say snowballs you don't see in Bechet's because I've seen all kinds of manifestations of Bechet's uveitis in my career. As I mentioned, there are more classic features of, of Bechet's uveitis, but um, snowballs being just uh, a representation of a, a certain type of inflammation that we see in a certain anatomical part of uh, the eye uh, can't be their, their presence can't be used to rule out um, Bechet's uveitis. So I think it's healthy to have debate, and sometimes um, people sometimes being controversial can generate. Uh, is this diplomatic enough for you? Uh, 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 you know, stimulate thought at least. But um, I personally disagree with that. Um, so. Discuss that with your with your doctor. I think I value when my patient comes to me and says, "Have you thought about this?" And if I don't know something, or if, or if I'm questioning my own uh, previous beliefs, then that's healthy in medicine. Great, thank you. So you've heard it straight from the horse's mouth. That's very good. And we have to be careful as doctors to be very careful about not being too black and white and dogmatic about things. Which, as you can imagine, with a unusual condition like better sometimes the answer is a little grayer so thank you very much Nima for uh, clarifying that so question for Dr Nair please um, so Dr Nair as a rheumatologist you've spoken about joint problems very well and clearly uh, in Betchett's um, when you've uh, published your article about pain in Betchett's a lot of the problem is really a chronic pain from a, a different thing, fibromyalgia syndrome. How would you kind of relate the two? Do you think really what we're looking at is more fibromyalgia or is it joint pains that are everywhere? And it's a confusing thing. How, how would you take that? I think uh, uh, the important thing is to take a good history and the history will tell you more than any investigation that if this is inflammation or not. Now, fibromyalgia is more of a uh, nosoplastic, nociplastic type, you know, where you get a lot of uh, pain sensitivity due to a body's, uh, you know, reaction to things. So essentially, our history will tell us more about whether this is an inflammatory problem or is, is it more like a, a non-inflammatory like fibromyalgia. So a good history, and then we can examine and we can look for inflammatory changes in the joints and we can confirm with uh, investigations which may include an ultrasound assessment or an MRI scan. And this will tell us enough to the, say that this pe uh, person has inflammation or is it a non-inflammatory problem. So I think the history and examination and investigations will clearly tell us the clue that this is inflammation or not inflammation. In our study, we looked at uh, people who had pain symptoms of widespread nature in different parts of the body as you would expect with you know, the, the diagnostic criteria. But this is not to say that some of these, uh, you know, people did not have inflammatory joint disease. But as I said, you know, the the, the number of people who have an inflammatory joint disease in Bechet's is less compared to the number of joint pain. So it's important to take a good history, examine, investigate, and confirm because lack, if you don't treat it adequately, it, it just gets worse. So and we have tools to treat adequately. So I think it's very clear we can find who has inflammation, not inflammation. Uh, it's, um, it's, 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 it can be found out. Thank you very much, Dragis. Uh, now, a couple of questions for Mona uh, from the neurology side. A quick warm-up for you. 
Um, what about decaf coffee? Can you have decaf coffee? Oh, well, that causes headaches too. <laughs> Some worried patient is thinking, gosh, I can't even have decaf coffee. Can she or can't she? Yes, so decaf coffee has caffeine, but it has less caffeine. So as long as you're sensible and uh, you're not taking too many decaf coffee, we say a handful a day, maximum. Okay, I hope that's uh, a satisfactory answer for you there. Uh, another quick question. Uh, another patient uh, gets what she says is really similar to hemiplegic migraine. Is that separate to migraine in Betchett's or can you get that type of migraine in Betchett's? Should she worry she's got something different? You can get that type of uh, migraine um, in Betchett's as well. And what I would call it is um, hemiplegic type symptoms. So where you get weakness down one side of the body and it can be weakness, it can be numbness, it can be tingling. But actually getting the diagnosis of hemiplegic migraine is a genetic diagnosis. So that's to do with sodium channel um, abnormalities. So I wouldn't call it hemiplegic migraine as such, although you do get hemiplegic type symptoms. Um, we would describe it as um, the aura associated with migraines, and that's very common in patients. Though, so you can have weakness, numbness, and paresthesia. Great, thank you. And the third question for you. Bad luck. Um, we're going to start going free for all in a minute. I'm just going to make sure everybody can actually uh, uh, have a question. Then that's when I really want you to be firing questions at us. So please be thinking about your questions. We've got some online. We'll work our way through them. So Mona, the next question is. Um, there's a lot of discussion about plasma exchange for neurobetchets, and the background to that is that there has been a centre with patients who, uh, where some patients have been having plasma exchange for neurobetchets and feel that they've they've benefited benefited from that, uh, but that is no longer available. And we'd just be keen to know whether or not you feel that there should be a big place for plasma exchange in, in Betchett's, or, or that's not something that we tend to normally think about for, for neuro Betchett's. What, what are your thoughts on that? Because it may potentially reassure people who would like to think they could access it if it's not likely to be uh, uh, a game changer for them. But if it is likely to be a game changer, then clearly there needs to be lobbying to see if it can be made available. What do you think? So I think it potentially could have its place, but um, plasma exchange was used um, years ago. So a lot of the studies or um, articles about, neuro, um, about plasma exchange are from the 80s and 90s and so on. So we've since then, you know, back then, uh, we didn't have as many treatments, immunosuppressive um, treatments as we have now, the options that we have now available. So we wouldn't really use plasma exchange as a first line therapy or a second line therapy potentially may have uh, its place when um, there is something acute going on and you just want something to be given there and then although even then we, we can consider alternative options like the steroids IVIG so it's either something that you know I know that uh, they've used it for ophthalmological causes I don't know whether Nima might have some comments on that uh, so ophthalmological presentations but as I said overall I would say that the role of plasma exchange is less um, so now than it was in the past. So it was an option in the past. We don't use it very much so nowadays because we have better options, alternative options. Oh, that's very helpful and, and clear. So there would have been a place for it. And I think my sense too is that there are many situations where we might have thought about plasma exchange, which isn't without its risks, but now with more effective therapies. Dr. Nair, I think you'd like to comment on that. I think uh, I, I deal with uh, batch, uh, sorry, uh, vasculitis in my uh, practice. So there was a time when uh, diseases like anca vasculitis were treated with plasma exchange because you clear the antibodies. Now with larger trials that it has shown that uh, plasma exchange is, does not make any difference to the outcome uh, you know, in terms of uh, benefit at one year or in, in fact preventing death. So I think plasma exchange as a, a method of treatment for most of the autoimmune diseases is actually going down. So I think it is not without complications and uh, we are moving away from a plasma exchange. But in when uh, we are in dire straits with nothing else to do, uh, offer to the patient and we want to salvage, then there is a place. But as a evidence-based medicine, there's no place for uh, kind of uh, plasma exchange in a vast majority of diseases, including anchor vasculitis. Thank you, that's very helpful. Graham, 
Professor Graham Wallace, you thought you could escape, but you can't. So I've got a question for you, which is uh, basically from a patient who wondered whether there's any place for uh, biologic drugs that target IL-13 in Betchett's. Is that pathway something that you'd be thinking about from a scientific angle could be underlying Betchett's? And if so, is that a therapeutic we should be looking at or are we better looking elsewhere, Graham? It's not really one that's come up in any of the studies that we've done. IL-13 is more related to the what we class the, the T helper 2 uh, pathways, which are linked to helping B cells and antibody production. Um, and obviously, we don't see much in the way of antibody and autoantibodies in Beshi's disease. It's not necessarily something I've come across, um, IL-13 of anybody else uh, identifying, we've, which is interesting because we've linked probably just about every other cytokine. Um, but no, it's not something that's on my radar or anything I've heard uh, recently. Okay, thank you for that. It's also not something that I would have been particularly thinking about myself, but obviously there must be somebody who's wondering about that. So it's not something that, that, that we would be expecting just around the corner for that. And another question, Graham. Um, it, it's, uh, uh, you might be able to help with it. Um, it's from Sharon saying, please can I direct a question to the lovely Dr. Graham Wallace? In fact, one of those words I just added myself. Um, but, but, you know, you get the thing. Uh, what was the butyrite supplement mentioned in the PowerPoint in the presentation last year uh, when Birmingham were hosting it? I'm afraid I, I, was, I wasn't there, so I don't know. Do you remember what that was? It's a study that's um, been done by Giacomo Emi um, across in, in Italy. Um, one of the things about the microbiome is not uh, just the, the species of bacteria that change, but actually the metabolites that are produced by the bacteria. Um, and what they've found in some of the studies that they've done, if you have a reduction in these molecules called short chain fatty acids, and butyrate is one of those. But what Giacomo was doing was to um, doing a study where he was giving um, what we would classify as, as, as prebiotics, and that is uh, foodstuffs that will actually produce uh, short-chain fatty acids, and also probiotics, where you take the butyrate itself and give it to the patients. Um, and what he found was that in terms of scoring systems of uh, Beshi's disease, that he did have an effect with both uh, diets and both changes in that. So he added... Um, the butyrate to what really would classify as the Mediterranean diet. Um, and there were some responses with that. So there is the potential, and this is something, you know, uh, or going forward is to look at the addition of things like butyrate to diets to see whether that can have an impact on um, some of the manifestations. Of Great. Thank you very much, Graham. A couple of quick questions coming through for Dr. Nair. Uh, first of all, uh, do you get joint deformity with fibromyalgia? Uh, you wouldn't expect joint deformity with fibromyalgia, for example. Uh, but if you have a kind of a degeneration in the joint due to a factor not related to fibromyalgia and uh, the fact that uh, you tend to do less of activity due to pain, then that can lead to the uh, dysfunction of the joint and can lead to deformity. So it's primarily due to Betchett's. Betchett's is a non-deforming, non-erosive inflammatory arthritis. Uh, but, uh, and also fibromyalgia does not lead to joint destruction. So it has to be some other factor that has to be looked into to say, was there any other factor which led to joint deformity? So fibromyalgia as such would not lead to joint deformity. So that's very reassuring. We, we see people with other joint problems like rheumatoid arthritis where joints just shrivel up. And it's reassuring, I think, that that's not what we would be expecting in Betchett's. It can cause sore joints, can cause chronic widespread pain, but it's not something that we would expect to be causing such damage to joints that they really are not working properly. I think so, uh, if there is deformity, it needs to be looked into, and uh, you have to contact a doctor for an assessment in this uh, case. Thank you. Dr. Pooler, we've got a question for you now. So, so Jackie, um, We've built up a lot about the importance of our support workers. 
and I just wondered if there's something that you might like to say to people that not everybody has had the opportunity to interact with you or your colleagues at the two other centres. Could you say one or two things to really sell? It won't be hard, it won't be hard at all. Why, if they're not able to meet with you, what are they missing, apart from a lovely person? Gosh, that's a bit of a challenge. Um, what are they missing? I guess um, they're missing, and this is no res disrespect to medical colleagues, the holistic view. We know that when patients come into the hospital, and it's quite right, there's a medical model of care. As a support coordinator, we're really lucky that we look a bit beyond that. And if a patient isn't, for whatever reason, able to come to the centre, perhaps that's the bit they're missing out on. So we look at the patient and we think, the patient is a person, first and foremost, with a life, with family, with careers, with aspirations. And those are the things that we focus on. And I think that's what patients would miss on if they couldn't come to the centre. And that's a really important thing. Um, I'd like to hope and, and think that everybody, at least in England, uh, has had the opportunity to interact with our support workers. But we're very conscious that the centres of excellence are only funded for England and not the whole of the, uh, the devolved nations. So there will be a lot of people from devolved nations and perhaps internationally who are watching this who won't have the benefit of interacting with you. What could they do? Is there anything that they could do if they don't have you, Jackie? Um, I guess what we can do is redirect those patients to their local agencies, be that for welfare rights or education support. Um, we are a bit, I think our hands are tied really, and as much as we can only directly support those patients who attend the centre. But if someone was to contact us who isn't at the centre, we, we certainly wouldn't not help them, but we would want to direct them to local services. I think that's probably um, as much as we could actually do. Yeah, that must be frustrating, really, because um, those of us that are uh, kind of practising in medicine um, just appreciate the value of Jackie and also Suzanne, our clinical psychologist. But if it's another condition, not Betchett's, we kind of scratch our heads as to where can we actually direct people to get help in their local services. And I think that's a really challenging thing. So if you are in England, if you do have Betchett's, if you haven't met with Jackie or one of her colleagues, you're missing out on something because you can access this and this is what the Jackie and her colleagues are, are there for. Um, another quick question, Jackie. Why bother about working? I'm not about you, but you know, we're having this big push so that we can encourage people to be working. Why? Um, I think my answer is based on really what patients tell us. It's not about what we think, it's what patients um, tell us when they talk about work or going back into work. And I think a primary um, uh, driver, as I think we'd all recognise, is the economic benefits because it's expensive, cost of living is expensive. Um, patients also tell us that work um, can be quite therapeutic in terms of being a distraction, um, mixing with other people, um, having you know um, aspirations, and uh, I think principally those are the things that, that patients tell us. And I think it's the important thing is that we're listening to what the patients are telling us, rather than we telling them what we think they should be hearing. And I guess that's one of the advantages of doing the work that we do because we do have the time both in clinic and outside of clinic to explore these things with patients. Thank you. Martin, you've been sitting quietly behind me. <coughs> um, I'd just be interested to hear from you. You've, you've interacted with a few uh, societies like AKU and things like that and setting up a, a registry. Um, how, how do you feel things are progressing or not progressing with regards to how things might develop for Betchett's? Um, and kind of associate with that, what do you think would be a, a prime benefit uh, if there was a Betchett's patient registry? 
Goodness. Um, in terms of the prime benefit, I mean, I think I, I use the Waldenstroms as a model that, that they've understood the disease profile a lot better. They've been able to look at the, the various treatments, uh, focus them down to sort of two primary ones in a, in a first line sense and follow those through. And they've been able to look at the efficacies of a second line treatment. I, I'm not fully au fait with uh, the treatments for Bechette's, but I'm sure it'd be quite a similar thing with that. And the other question was, sorry, the first one. How are things potentially progressing with regards? How do you think there's a direction of travel? Is it all very preliminary? What are your senses about how things are moving? Uh, slowly, I think. I've been speaking with Tony. I think I met him at a, a um, Beacon conference three or four years ago. Um, we've provided a certain amount of knowledge to him. And I know Tony's looked at other solutions. I think if, if you've got uh, a clinical consensus or you can get one, it's really deciding what you want to look at, what that end goal is, what are you hoping to achieve, and then work backwards with the, the key clinicians in the area to understand what data you need to gather. Um, speaking for our company, we would take about three to four months to go from your specification to a fully working database. That's pretty fast. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I, I've got, uh, well, while you're thinking up a question, I'll just read out, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. The comment says, thanks. And I'm not sure how to put the emphasis on this. It says, where is the ophthalmologist located, please? I'm not sure, where is, where do you dig him up from? Or <laughs> where is this wonderful ophthalmologist? It's a bit hard to understand which way it is. I'd like to think it's where is the wonderful ophthalmologist from? Um, and I, I, I can answer that one. He's from Liverpool and he attends the Betchett Centre uh, in Liverpool. Uh, okay, that's, that's great. Uh, questions from the floor, or rather people sitting on the floor. Great. Thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you for today. I uh, appreciate your presentations and time you've given us today. You've answered a lot of questions, so hopefully this, uh, my question doesn't belie that there is no such thing as a stupid question. Um, I was diagnosed 28 years ago, and I've still got the same question. I'm from Leeds in West Yorkshire. Last time I looked, it wasn't on the Silk Road. Um, how did I and everyone else get Betches? Well, I think I'll direct that question to Graham, our scientist, who, who will be able to give us a short and succinct uh, reply to this, which is probably, I don't know, but I think you'll say it a little bit better than that. Um, it may well be more to do with the fact of having a Celtic background. Um, Beche is really, uh, as far as we understand it, uh, sort of started off in, in the areas of the Middle East and Central Europe. Um, and, you know, the Celtic migration along the Mediterranean, through places like um, uh, Brittany into Ireland um, and into the UK. And it may well be that there's a, a, a perhaps a Celtic genetic link to that aspect of it. But the biggest issue that we have, of course, is that we've got lots of genes that may be involved, but we don't know quite how they actually um, distinguish the diseases in different areas. And what we have published on before is the fact that you may have a gene polymorphism, a mutation in a gene that's associated with patients in the UK, but not in patients, say, in the Middle East. But in the Middle East, there's a, a mutation in another gene that will actually have the same effect. Um, so therefore, the, the mechanisms that may be affected uh, by these gene mutations are what we're looking at now, rather than the gene mutations themselves. But it may be that in the, your far distant past, um, you, you, you've got a Celtic background. Great. Well, that clarifies that then, Graham. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And it's a good question. And, you know, we're frustrated. We can't answer it, really. And think one way we will. Another question there. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much all for your time today. It was really wonderful and informative. Um, I just wanted to ask a question regarding anti-TNF. When you mentioned that the other drug on, in the trial um, is no longer being manufactured, do we know whether uh, NIC will approve any other anti-TNF apart from infliximab? Um, I'm currently on infliximab, and it's just I'm just wondering really if it ends up not being efficacious anymore, 
what would be the pathway for Betchett's patients? Well, I think um, it's a fantastic question, and it's a question that we're putting to NHS England uh, with a real bit of compulsion, really, because uh, people that are on a biologic drug can respond forever and ever almost, but sometimes they lose effectiveness of it, and what can we do? Well, at the moment, we can swap to one of the sister TNF blockers, which can often work if infliximab doesn't work, but then if that doesn't work, we're struggling. But there are other drugs up our sleeve but they're not funded so we would recommend having something like tocilizumab and IL-6 inhibitor and Dr. Gadir is an expert in in that in eye disease it's a good drug it's likely to be helpful but it's not funded so what we're trying to do at the moment is to uh, lobby NHS England and your help and support in this is going to be very helpful uh, to try and make sure that they can have more drugs that we know are likely to work, maybe don't use it quite as much, um, and that's something that the guidelines also are pushing for. So it's hard for NHS England, who are doing a good job, and I think that they've transformed things by allowing us to have funding for some biologics, if we've got guidelines out there, state-of-the-art best practice, but that's not being funded, that puts a lot of pressure on them. With regards to interferon, uh, we are uh, lobbying industry at the moment to see if we can persuade some of the companies that do make uh, forms of interferon to make that available for patients with Betchett's. But as you can imagine, that's not straightforward because there's all sorts of regulatory and other issues. So it's a very important problem that you raise. It's great that things are going well now. We hope that that will continue. But we do feel that there will be already some drugs that can be used if necessary and if we can persuade somebody to pay for them not out of their own pockets, but, you know, uh, I think hopefully we can actually get there. But that's a very important point. There are gaps, and we are trying to work to fill them. Any other questions? Yes, at the lad at the front. If you, the, 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 the microphones are really helpful because people listening online can, can hear it then. Thanks so much for this uh, wonderful day. Um, kind of linking in on that topic of the biologics, is there any formal evidence comparing other biologic agents like adalimumab versus infliximab or ocikinumab and is there any evidence that some of them may be better for certain like phenotypes or you know clinical manifestations of Betchett's disease and in the UK are you kind of obliged to prescribe infliximab first before like adalimumab? So great question our approach really is to try and have a phenotype-based approach. That means we tailor the drug according to how the disease is affecting you. And that's not quite so easy. But whoever sorted out and put forward the first drugs pathway, not sure you can see me winking or not, made it very vague. So we talk about going for infliximab first. And there's a good reason, because you have it as an infusion, it gets very high levels in the blood. So in eye disease, it might potentially you know, work a little better. But we know that in eye disease, adalimumab works absolutely fine. And we've really said, if you don't respond or you know, if you're not using infliximab, then another TNF inhibitor could be considered, which is basically any of about five. Um, and we've been reminded recently that one of the first iterations of the drugs pathway was a little vague, and that's a deliberate reason for that. So the bottom line is uh, other TNF blockers are fine. The only uh, high-quality head-to-head trial of two biologics was the BioBetchets. There haven't been any others, but we expect that other TNF blockers to work broadly similar. And in fact, some people actually would start somebody uh, with, say, uveitis. Perhaps, uh, Nima, you can just tell us about treatment of, just very briefly, of uveitis with uh, infliximab and things, because a lot of, or, or in adlimab, a lot of things is hitting people hard uh, quickly. And, and that's something that I think that you're doing that we would also like to do in Betchett's. I mean, I have a low threshold of um, uh, getting people on either adalimumab or infliximab. Uh, in practice for uveitis, I don't see that much difference in efficacy between those two. Even secokinumab uh, has evidence in uveitis, it's just it's not as strong as, as the other two. So hence, in the phenotype-based approach, if there's no eye, eye disease, that, that, that's an option. But if there's u uveitis, um, it's not. But 
I mean, as a Lumen Mab in our uveitis clinics, for us is a little bit easier to start in that, we, and we have a bit more experience with it. But I, um, exactly for the reasons why Prof Moots mentioned that I've got no issues whatsoever with um, people starting on, on infliximab. Um, and hopefully there'll be new um, treatments coming soon. I'm looking at for other conditions, um, pathways, which I'm sure may have some benefits in Bechet's uveitis in the future. So it, it is an exciting time from that perspective. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Yes. Rachel. Gemma's rushing up, getting a few steps in. Yeah, it's a bit of a, a sort of general personal question, actually. Um, I was wondering if you had seen more instances of familial vetchets where it's either passed from parent to child or between siblings, but perhaps parents don't then have vetchets disease themselves. Um, just because my daughter is showing signs of Bechet's disease with recurrent ulcers and pustular spots, but it's kind of been sort of dismissed as quite common in childhood. Um, so I was just wondering if you'd seen any kind of increased incidence of familial Bechet's and... Sure, thank you. And it's a very understandable question that we get asked frequently for really good reasons. I'm going to ask Graham uh, if you'd like to comment on that briefly and I'll comment briefly on it as well. And then what we'll do after that is we'll go around asking about uh, either breakthroughs or imminent breakthroughs for people. So Graham, what do you what do you take on that? We generally don't consider Bechet's to be a hereditary disease. Um, having said that, what there is what uh, uh, aspect of familial aggregation. So in a wider family, you may find um, conditions like Bechet's um, being, being prevalent. The, the issue, again, it comes potentially back down to the genetic mutations. Um, and obviously, genetic mutations are passed from parents onto children. Bechet's is a combination of many, many mutations leading to particular disease. So, but there's always going to be that possibility that these it can also be passed on to a child. So while it's not uh, hereditary, it's not something that we would normally um, attach to Bechet's, there is no doubt that the possibility is there. Yes, thank you, Graham. And, and, and our experience is that um, it, it does occur, but very infrequently. So um, we do have some families where a parent has Bechet's and the child has, uh, exceptionally rare and one of the beauties of actually doing clinics at Alder Hay for in Liverpool uh, we have all the children and young people seen at Alder Hay by Claire Payne who's a paediatric consultant um, she's not able to come today uh, but uh, when we do a clinic I would go across uh, with Sarah Hardy our nurse consultant so we get a good feel for all the children and young people there there are very 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 few where there's a parent uh, with, with Betchett's um, so I think there would be a theoretical slight increased risk, and as Graham was saying, it's a combination not just of what you inherit in the genes, but something that we don't yet understand in the environment, maybe something to do with the microbiome somewhere. And it's an entirely legitimate worry. Practically, we tend not to see it apart from exceptionally. On the other hand, um, as Graham suggested, uh, or maybe you suggested, Rachel, that say mouth ulcers, for example, are very common. 20% of the population will get uh, recumbent the stomatitis. If a parent has got Bechet's, you would be very understandably, you know, anxious, concerned, aware, and probably get your child seen a little bit sooner. So what it means is if there was Bechet's, it's unlikely but possible it would get diagnosed quickly and usually with the parent uh, when they got diagnosed with Betchus it took forever before a diagnosis occurred so it's not likely but it is possible there is plenty of experience of children and young people to be able to assess them and and look at them uh, so not likely but try not to worry about it although as a mum you know it's a natural thing isn't it to be to be worrying thank you for that question Okay, so we're going to start with Dr. Gadiri, if that's all right. We're going to work our way around, and I'm going to be asking if you can share with you what's the, uh, a, a recent major breakthrough in Betchett's. And the answer might be, well, there's nothing, but I wish there was a breakthrough in that way. So, Nima, how would you address that? Because, you know, realistically, is there a major breakthrough? If there isn't, what do you see 
is going to become a major breakthrough. And also, do you know the lottery numbers? Um, um, so I hope I'll, I'll go with what I foresee, which is well, outside aspirations of new, new therapeutics, new treatments, and um, new understandings of the um, immunopathogenesis of Bechet's in the eye. What I'm excited about in the UK especially, um, which is leading the world in this, is uh, the diagnostics using AI and big data using our um, biobanks, which was unfortunately in the news this week. Um, um, and the combination of the imaging that we do in, in ophthalmology and artificial intelligence and big data, and hopefully being able to stratify and um, prognosticate, so um, see what kind of um, Bechet's UVI entity this can be and what it might develop into before things happen, and not you know not replace the doctor, but just give us data which really helps us um, make make judgment calls on how severe a person's Bechet's eye disease will be. So I think that's probably, uh, I mean, the UK in Birmingham, especially in London, um, there's a health, there's an, a hub called the Insights Eye Hub. There's various um, collaborations happening throughout the country. But I, I, I do hope that maybe five or 10 years from now, um, the machines that we use will be just giving us that quantifiable data, uh, which will really help um, enrich um, our assessments of patients. Thank you. I think you'll still be in a job, Nima, don't worry. Gemma, what about from the uh, mouth perspective? I think there's probably no new breakthroughs from a mouth-specific perspective, but I think what would be useful is there's the use of therapeutics or different therapeutics and biologics has obviously increased, but it's more maybe looking at an overall systemic perspective rather than actually thinking about what does that work in terms of oral ulceration. So a lot of our patients tell us that sometimes we give different bits of advice and it's almost like a bit of a trial and error. So we start with trying different mouthwashes, then different systemic agents. So it would be good if we had a bit more information about how good those things work. So we almost did have a, a better ladder to be able to work through rather than a bit more of a trial and error. But I think from a paediatric dentistry perspective, obviously children's oral health is, is very topical at the moment and there's a lot of issues associated with that. But having the centers of excellence and having a dentist as part of that is a very, very big thing because it gives us a lot of exposure to be able to learn how to better understand our patients' needs and, and inform the decision-making. Um, and it's also good because it probably brings oral health into a, into a bigger light maybe that it hadn't been in the past. So I definitely think that is a good thing. And the more that we can get oral health and the more we can get dental professionals into any MDT sort of clinics, the, the better to get the messages out there, really. Thank you, Gemma. Jagdish. I think the breakthrough is uh, the awareness of uh, diagnosis of Betchett's has increased. So I, when I started as a consultant in Betchett's 12 years ago, or 11, 12 years ago, I think we didn't see uh, many uh, you know, people being uh, considering the possibility of Betchett's. Now we see even uh, you know, patients coming to A&E, the A&E doctors refer as query Betchett's. So I think the awareness has increased, that's what I think. The challenge has been about um, understanding the pathogenesis of disease. This is quite a variable disease with different people manifest completely differently. So we don't understand the pathogenesis of this disease very well. I think that's a challenge. And uh, I think the awareness or, or the, the research into this is evolving. So we may have better understanding of the disease going forward. And that may help to kind of, uh, you know, have the medications, um, for, uh, like in a personalized medicine for the the patients who have different manifestations. So like you said, um, you know, uh, how we, the, the phenotypic characteristics of the disease, how we provide personalized medicine to the patients with different forms of the disease. So I think that's a challenge. Uh, I think our, when our understanding of the disease improves, we may have more medications. At this moment, there's a paucity of the armamentarium of drugs to treat the disease. And uh, after some time, we have to recycle the drugs, which is quite a, a, a challenge. Uh, so I think 
that these are some of the things I think are challenging. Thank you. Mona. So I think uh, from neurology point of view, there, um, the main breakthrough has been the, some of the treatments for headache disorders, which would also be very useful in patients with Bechet's disease. So the molecule that I mentioned, CGRP, which is increased in patients with headache disorders, and that's the case in patients with Bechet's as well. Um, we now have treatments that specifically target that particular molecule and block its action, and they have been revolutionary in management of headache disorders. Majority of patients who go on these treatments find them life-changing, so it's been absolutely wonderful for us to have that. The challenges, I think, would be, because Neurobechets is so rare, we don't see it that often. Um, as Jack was saying, I agree that it would be good for us to know the pathophysiology a little bit better. Could there potentially be some disease markers that we could have that we could, we could either predict that this patient is at risk of having neurobechets and having a you know particular bad attack of neurobechets, or um, if they have a symptom, is it neurobechets or is it actually something else that's causing that condition a contributing um, factor or condition? Thank you, Mona. And then we'll uh, wind up with Jackie and then Martin from their perspectives. No pressure, guys. Um, I think probably uh, rather than a challenge. And Graham as well. Sorry, Graham, you can't escape. <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do Jackie, Martin and then Graham. Gosh, that was a close song. Okay, I'll start again. Um, I think rather than a challenge, I think I would um, suggest I have a bit of a wish list. Um, many of our patients incur huge costs to come to the centres because they travel from the devolved countries. And I think what would be wonderful for the future and probably a, a huge cha challenge, but also a wish list, is that we could have, if not exactly centres of excellence, but certainly centres where patients could go to in the devolved countries, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, because we do worry about prohibitive travel costs actually affecting patients' abilities to get to the centre. Um, I don't know how feasible that would be, Prof, whether that's just something that will never happen, but it would be good for those patients. Agreed. We find it very frustrating uh, when we have patients from the other end of the country. Um, we're happy to see them, we're keen to see them, but our heart goes out to the fact that they've got to take time off work, often for two days. The costs are, are really phenomenal. So I think that's a really good point, Jackie. Thank you. Uh, Martin and then Graham. Just wondering if you'd consider doing, doing Zoom meetings for some of those. I know in person you can't beat it, but um, Zoom as an interim. Yeah, in fact, we, we, we do to a certain extent. Uh, we do telephone calls, which are a kind of rubbish. Uh, during uh, COVID, we had uh, uh, NHS attend anywhere, which was kind of also pretty rubbish. I, I personally do quite a few Zoom calls in other situations. And I think, Martin, that you're right. We should be a little bit more up to date with regards to how we interact. Um, photographs of ulcers are great. Sometimes you just have to examine people. Sometimes you don't need to. So that's a great point. Thank you. So what would I, I, I like to see? Um, if I had a magic wand, I'd like to work with you guys and get some sort of consensus, clinical consensus, and potentially be here next year talking about a Bechet's registry. Great. I thought you might say that, and uh, no, good. That's that's very good. That's important, helpful, and we'll 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 finish uh, with uh, Professor Wallace for your thoughts. What's around the corner, Graham, or what's been the greatest thing recently? Hopefully, we've got to work out the pathophysiology of the disease. Um, and you know, the, those statements are absolutely correct. Um, I think one of the things that, that has actually moved forward a bit is this idea of clustering the patients. So we've seen it in our Japanese colleagues, we've had other groups have done this as well. Um, and what this may do is, is to put, rather than it's not going to be personalised, but put patients into a particular grouping based on their manifestations, and that that can lead to better understanding of which drugs that we would lead with. So, for example, um, things like neurobeshies, ocular beshies, particularly the retinal forms and arthritis, are really linked to, to vasculitis. It's breakdown of barriers and, and uh, cells getting in there where they shouldn't. Whereas other things on the uh, uh, mucosal surfaces are probably more fundamental uh, conditions. So 
there may be a way forward with that. Um, we've got huge lists of genes that we've identified, um, cytokines that we've identified, and so forth. And I would, again, agree with the concept of using AI to try and put this into a, a better structure that we can actually understand what is happening along the way. The other thing with AI, of course, is, um, and this slightly comes back to the comment about patients themselves, but actually to be able to take images themselves of, of lesions. And it's now becoming possible to take uh, retinal images on your phone and actually putting them into the system. So we've got some longitudinal data uh, that can be put into AI processes. But I, I, I think the from that side of that, I think that's going to give us the biggest advance in understanding the, uh, the individual patient's journey. I think the other thing that's got potential here is linked to this concept we were talking about, about things like butyrate. Um, the, the whole story with the microbiome, the problem with microbiome is when you look at the gut microbiome in any disease, then it's different from healthy controls. So the, to suggest that it's driving all these diseases is maybe not the case. It, the cause and effect is still an issue. But this aspect of metabolites that would normally be produced by certain bacteria in the gut, um, and there's lower levels of them, I think that this can actually give us um, potentially new way in which we can actually um, influence what's happening in the disease. Um, it's still very early days. Giacomo's trial is virtually the only one that's out there, but it's something we need to think about uh, considering ourselves of looking at these levels and what molecules might be useful. Great. Well, thank you. So you heard it from here first. OK, well, uh, this is the end of the medical panel. Well, the medical panel meeting. Hopefully the medical panel people will still uh, be alive and have a nice weekend and so. Thank you very much for allowing us to be presenting to you. Thank you very much for coming across to Liverpool. I have to say, you're the best audience we've had all day. And uh, I'll just hand back over to Tony now to, uh, to wind up the proceedings. And we'll look forward to seeing you again, either in Liverpool or anywhere else. And it's been great for your questions and been great to be able to speak to you today. Right, a um, uh, couple of things. Um, slide up here to say feedback, very important. Please place them on the table uh, at, at the back on the left when you, when you go, please. And those online, please fill out the form. It's really fundamental so we can adjust this uh, to what you want. Please also leave your name badges uh, and lanyards there as well. Um, and a final reminder, reference parking, make sure you go and log in about uh, with the desk before you leave, otherwise you pay a larger fee. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so what I want to do is just say thanks, obviously, very importantly to everybody. Um, first, Martin and Ian um, from Aston Media. I think this is the third time you've been with us. Thank you very much for your very professional and helpful uh, um, uh, assistance with making this such a success. And related to that, Gemma, um, massive effort to put this together. I mean, she goes on much more than she's been paid for, frankly. Um, so well done. Um, third, I've put down Jan and all her team uh, for helping out here on the day, uh, and also my trustees with, with all the bits and pieces that need, needed doing, so thank you. Um, and then um, Professor Moots and his fantastic team um, and also Professor Phil Murray, you won't have seen, he's been online answering questions, and obviously Professor Graham Wallace for, for what they've been doing. Uh, and I'd also mention, as a slight aside, Joanna Zeiss, who've, who's in America, and a, a number of you will know her. She's an associate member of the uh, International Society of Patients' Disease. Um, she's written three books on the thing. In fact, that's the first thing I did when I was a trustee, was read her three books. Um, I've often used her when I've had helpline queries from individuals across the globe, which we do get, uh, and Joanna has con connections and knowledge of all kinds of clinicians and people, so uh, I'm very, very grateful for that. I use this opportunity to flag it up. Um, and also, of course, uh, the members and patients uh, who have attended here in person and online, um, for whom all this is about. Okay? It's not about us, it's about you, so thank you for making the effort. I will just mention publicly, there were quite a few no-shows today. 
uh, and this often does occur, although it's larger than the normal. We'll try and get to the bottom of it, because it is important that we have to pay for the, the rooms, uh, and depending on the number of people, we then have to set uh, a limit. And of course, if people don't turn up, for all the people who wanted to come, they can't. So I know it's a very difficult thing, uh, and that's why it's so vital that we do this duplicate online version uh, so that we, we can benefit it, and then people can look at the recordings later on. Uh, and in that vein, for all of you who did intend online and, and in discussion on Facebook or any other sort of media, please let it be known that all the recordings will be on uh, linked to our data, uh, to our um, website, uh, as it is all our other ones in the last uh, three or four years, uh, because there's a massive amount of really useful information that many patients will benefit from. Okay, so I think that's all my thanks. I apologise if I've missed anybody out. Um, and uh, my final sort of message really is take care when you're going home, and particularly for you people driving, uh, uh, really do drive very carefully. Thank you very much to everybody, and I wish you all well.